When a mysterious burning object crashes in Australia, scientists are left absolutely stunned after analyzing it and uncovering the secrets it held. The call reached Dr. Hannah Mercer just after dawn. It wasn't an aircraft, the officer from the Pilbara region police said, and it didn't behave like any meteorite they had encountered before. The desert air was still cool enough to feel forgiving, as she listened in silence, learning that mine workers near Newman had reported a strange object along a service road, partially buried, still radiating heat hours after it had fallen from the sky. The way he hesitated before that last sentence told her more than his words did. By the time Hannah arrived, the sun had already begun to flatten the horizon into a pale blur. The red earth stretched outward in every direction, empty and indifferent, broken only by a shallow scar carved into the ground. At its center lay the object, half buried and darkened, its surface warped into smooth, unfamiliar curves. Heat shimmered faintly above it, long after anything made of ordinary metal should have surrendered to the air. Mine workers stood nearby, quieter than usual. One of them told her it had been burning when they found it, not flames, exactly, but glowing with a deep internal warmth, as if it hadn't yet accepted that it had reached the surface. Hannah knelt at a careful distance and raised her thermal scanner. The device hesitated, recalibrated, and then produced readings that made her frown. The temperature was dropping, but not evenly. Heat appeared to be moving through the object in segments, migrating internally rather than dissipating outward. Sergeant Liam O'Connor, overseeing the site, noticed her hesitation. That bad? He asked. That's strange, Hannah replied, and strange is worse. What the so-called debris was harboring was far more deliberate than anyone initially assumed. The phrase space debris appeared in the first official report before the object had even been moved. Hannah understood the impulse. It was familiar, technically accurate enough to calm concern, and vague enough to absorb contradictions. But as the object was transported under armed escort to a secure research facility outside Perth, the explanation began to feel thinner with every kilometer. Hannah had spent her career studying re-entry physics. She knew how satellites fragmented, how rocket components twisted and scattered, how meteorites behaved when they met the atmosphere at speed. This object had done none of those things. Its impact angle suggested control rather than chance, and its final position looked less like a crash than a forced descent. Inside the facility, engineers and technicians circled the object with restrained fascination. Initial scans revealed layered composite materials arranged in repeating geometric patterns, more precise than structural necessity demanded. Internal cavities appeared where no mechanical function was immediately obvious, empty spaces placed deliberately rather than randomly. Dr. Raj Patel, the materials engineer assigned to the analysis, studied the projections longer than anyone else. This wasn't assembled, he said quietly. It was optimized. Hannah agreed. Nothing about the design suggested improvisation. This was a deliberately designed device. But who would design something like this? And why? They had to dig deeper to find these answers. The first attempt to breach the outer layer was made with diamond-edged cutting tools. When the blade met the surface, there was a brief, high-pitched whine, then resistance vanished. Not because the cut succeeded, but because the blade itself had dulled almost instantly. A plasma cutter followed. Heat bloomed across the surface under thermal cameras, but instead of burning through, the material warped just enough to disperse it. Even more unsettling, the heat did not concentrate at the point of contact. It migrated inward, spreading along internal layers as if guided. Raj folded his arms at the console. It's not resisting, he said after a long pause. If it were, we'd see fractures. Failure points. He shook his head slowly. This is adjustment. That night, Hannah remained alone in the lab, reviewing thermal decay curves. At first, the cooling pattern looked merely uneven, but the longer she watched, the more the irregularities aligned. Heat moved through internal sections in a repeating sequence, precise enough to predict. Every 47 minutes, the cycle reset. She re-ran the analysis, stripped noise from the data, and overlaid older readings, including those taken at the crash site. The same pattern appeared there too, faint but unmistakable. She called Raj back into the lab before midnight. Neither spoke for several minutes as the data played again. Materials don't do this, Raj said finally. Systems do. Hannah nodded. The word system changed everything. By the fourth day, the atmosphere inside the facility had shifted. Security tightened quietly. New personnel appeared without introduction. Conversations shortened. Data requests slowed or returned partially redacted. 
The scientific team fractured along unspoken lines. One group leaned toward a familiar explanation, classified aerospace technology, foreign, experimental, politically sensitive. That explanation carried comfort. It placed the object within human intent. Another group argued the opposite. They insisted the data was being overinterpreted, that fatigue and novelty were magnifying anomalies that would eventually resolve into something mundane. Hannah found both explanations unsatisfying. During a briefing that afternoon, as speculation circled around launch windows and geopolitical rivals, she interrupted. We keep asking where it came from, she said, but we're not asking why it survived. The room fell silent. Sergeant O'Connor studied her. You think that was intentional? I think survival was assumed, Hannah replied, which suggests re-entry wasn't considered a failure mode. No one argued, but no one agreed either. The discovery that shifted everything did not arrive with alarms or sudden revelation. It emerged the way most important findings do in science, quietly, almost accidentally, buried in routine work that only mattered because someone was paying close attention. Mia had been assigned to review internal scan anomalies, a task often given to junior analysts precisely because it required patience rather than assumption. While mapping the inner cavities of the object, she noticed irregular textures along the chamber walls that did not align with structural layering. At first, she assumed it was sensor noise or imaging artifacts caused by the material's unusual composition, but when the pattern persisted across multiple scans and angles, she flagged it for closer examination. Under magnification, the residue resolved into thin, filament-like traces clinging to the chamber walls in faint, repeating arcs. The material was brittle, degraded by heat, but unmistakably engineered. Spectral analysis identified it as a specialized ablative composite, similar in principle to materials used to protect spacecraft during re-entry, but applied here in a way that suggested internal use rather than external shielding. Not biological, not contamination, not random. The distribution told a story. Whatever had once occupied the chamber had been central, suspended, and designed to fail safely. The residue formed patterns consistent with controlled degradation, as if the material had been engineered to break down under specific thermal and mechanical thresholds. Mia chose her words carefully when she presented her findings. It wasn't meant to survive, she said, indicating the chamber. At least, not all of it. Raj studied the data in silence, his brow furrowed. But the shell was, he replied at last. That distinction reframed everything. The object had not failed to protect its contents. It had executed a design choice. The payload, whatever its function, had been expendable by design, while the structure surrounding it had been optimized for endurance. The implication unsettled Hannah deeply. This was no accident, no malfunction. The object had done exactly what it was built to do, under conditions meant to push it to failure. The response came swiftly, but without drama, there were no emergency briefings or urgent directives, no visible assertion of authority. Instead, Hannah received a carefully worded message requesting her presence in Canberra for consultation. The phrasing was polite, the expectation was not. The meeting in Canberra took place in a windowless room, attended by people who introduced themselves only by role. They spoke calmly about public perception, international sensitivity, and the need to avoid premature conclusions. The message was simple. The object itself wasn't the issue. How it was interpreted was. By the end of the meeting, the decision was already made. The object would be classified as experimental aerospace debris. Access would be restricted. Data would be reviewed appropriately. Nothing about the explanation felt urgent, because to them, nothing had gone wrong. Their tone was measured, almost reassuring, but the underlying message was unmistakable. The object itself was no longer the issue. What mattered was how it might be interpreted. Questions that lacked immediate answers were framed as risks. Ambiguity, it became clear, was considered more destabilizing than any single explanation, even an incomplete one. A narrative, however provisional, was preferable to open-ended inquiry. Hannah asked whether further analysis would continue. Appropriately, one official replied, and the word carried more finality than reassurance. Back at the facility that night, the lab felt subdued, as though the building itself had absorbed the outcome. Raj found Hannah reviewing archive scans long after most of the staff had gone home. Without ceremony, he handed her a small flash drive. I copied everything, he said. The early scans, the raw data, the parts that don't fit the summary. 
Hannah held the drive for a moment before slipping it into her bag. They're going to say this was resolved, she said. Raj nodded. Then someone should remember what it actually looked like. She agreed, quietly aware that memory itself had become an act of resistance. Weeks later, Hannah returned to the crash site under the guise of environmental review. Officially, the visit was routine, intended to assess soil disturbance and potential contamination. Unofficially, she needed to see the place again, not as a scientist cataloging data, but as someone trying to understand context. The scar in the earth had been partially filled, the ground smoothed to resemble the surrounding terrain. From a distance, it looked unremarkable. Up close, it felt altered. The desert was quieter there, not dramatically so, but enough to notice. Tracks that should have crossed the site curved around it instead. Birds circled overhead without landing. Insects were sparse. Equipment behaved inconsistently. A handheld GPS drifted off position. Thermal sensors registered faint residual warmth beneath the surface long after sunset, likely a result of insulating materials buried during cleanup, but persistent enough to stand out. Hannah knelt and pressed her palm to the ground. It wasn't hot, it simply felt reluctant, as though the soil had absorbed something it had not yet finished releasing. A local tracker, accompanying the survey, observed her silently before speaking. Country remembers, he said. Hannah understood the phrase, not as mysticism, but as ecology. Disturbance leaves traces. Landscapes store history in ways that do not require intention. That night, she dreamed again of the internal chamber. Not empty, not occupied, but precisely shaped around absence. In the weeks that followed, nothing happened publicly. The facility remained quiet. The research team was reassigned or reduced. Data requests were acknowledged but unanswered. Emails stopped arriving. The object itself was moved again, its destination undisclosed. Officially, the investigation was ongoing. Unofficially, Hannah sensed the opposite. The silence felt less like uncertainty and more like completion, as if the answers already existed and all that remained was deciding when and how they would be allowed to surface. Three months later, the object finally received an official classification. Quietly, no press conference followed, no announcement reframed the story. Instead, a short technical notice circulated through academic and aerospace channels, dense with terminology and stripped of drama, to the public it barely registered. But to Hannah, it explained everything. The object recovered near Newman was confirmed to be part of an experimental aerospace re-entry test platform, a non-orbital module designed to study controlled atmospheric descent, thermal survivability, and material endurance under extreme re-entry conditions. It was not a satellite, it was not a meteorite, and it was not debris in the conventional sense. It was a test. The structure had been engineered to remain intact through descent, impact, and prolonged heat retention. The layered composite shell, the internal thermal cycling, the resistance to cutting tools, all of it aligned with one purpose, to survive re-entry long enough to be recovered and analyzed. The missing internal chamber finally made sense as well. It had housed a sacrificial payload, designed to degrade under specific thermal and mechanical thresholds. Its failure wasn't accidental, it was part of the experiment. The shell endured, the internal system didn't. That was the data. The object's unusual heat behavior, the internal migration rather than surface dissipation, was a feature, not a flaw. It allowed engineers to observe how energy moved through layered materials during descent, something simulations still struggled to model accurately. As for why it landed where it did, the answer was less dramatic than speculation had suggested. The test platform had been released along a projected recovery corridor. Atmospheric variables shifted. The descent remained controlled, but the landing point drifted beyond its intended zone. Remote, empty, overlooked, until it wasn't. The designation space debris hadn't been a lie. It had been a placeholder, a term broad enough to be technically correct without inviting unnecessary attention while verification was still underway. Hannah understood then why the response had unfolded the way it did. There had been no urgency to explain the object, because to those who built it, nothing had gone wrong. The platform had behaved exactly as designed. It survived re-entry, it preserved its data, and when it could no longer be ignored, it was quietly reclaimed by process rather than spectacle. Standing once more at the now-smoothed crash site during her final review, Hannah felt no unease. 
only clarity. The desert hadn't been visited by something unknown. It had briefly intersected with a future already under construction. The object was an evidence of something beyond human reach. It was evidence of how much already exists beyond public awareness. And that, she realized, was why the discovery had unsettled people so deeply. Not because it was mysterious, but because it was real. What do you think? How would you feel stumbling across something like this? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, until next time.